from the Sky News Centre, this is Paul Murray Live. Thank you, Sherry. Hopefully you and your family have a wonderful weekend. We've got a big one ahead of us tonight, but let's begin in the state of Queensland and the fraud that is Stephen Miles. Now, slowly but surely, we are learning more and more about how bad his premiership is, but people know it, and hopefully there will be a change of government there later in the year. But, of course, this is the bloke who has laughed about the issues of youth crime, despite the fact that he was being asked a question about youth crime, and then we were told, no, he definitely wasn't laughing about youth crime. This is the bloke who still sees millions of dollars that he has to pay on the behalf of the Queensland Government, the New South Wales Government, for all those people that ended up in quarantine. Oh, what a wonderful stunt. How good is Queensland? Go the Maroons. Seriously? This is also the bloke who was admitted to lying in the Parliament. He's done that, of course, as Premier. And the early report card is not great. By-elections that have been held have seen a long-term Labor seat flip another one, have a massive swing against it, and every opinion poll suggests this bloke should be gone by the end of the year, fingers crossed. But he had some air support today, and that was from the Prime Minister. Anthony Albanese was in Queensland giving an address to the Queensland Media Club. Somebody who was there will join us in a couple of minutes' time. And he actually had the gall to turn around and talk up a Premier as clueless as Stephen Miles. I think that uh, uh, Stephen Miles uh, has, is someone who's a friend of mine to declare an interest. And I think that uh, Stephen Miles is putting forward a, a vision for Queensland that includes the Energy and Jobs Plan. And at the uh, Queensland LNP seemed to me to be run by the same people who ran the Newman government, and that didn't end well. Seriously? We're really going to try to pin on David Crucifulli, the government that came to power after years of the Bly government, the Beatty government before that, it lasted three years, it was replaced, and this mob have, of course, run everything into the ground since that moment took place. Now, they've been very good at politics. They were saved by a pandemic. They played the lowest card in the deck to stay in power. But another example about uh, Giggles Miles having no idea what he's actually doing here, and yet again just caving in to the people who prop up the Labor Party, that being the tough guys of the CFMEU. Now, Peter mentioned this a bit earlier tonight, but I want to double down and give you some more information. There is an outrageous series of things which have been given to unionised construction workers working on the big projects in Queensland, a gift from a government that, of course, should be focused on youth crime, should be focused on cost of living, should be focused on a lot more things, but no, no, this is the way that it works when, of course, the only reason you are Premier is because the unions got behind you to get rid of Anastasia Palaszczuk, the unions got behind you to make sure that Fentiman got out of the way and there was no contest for the leadership. Well, have a look at this. The CFMEU, the sweetheart deal includes a $100 a week bonus for workers who need to use their mobile phone for work. What? That works out at, what, $400 a month? There isn't a mobile phone plan in Australia that's $400 a month. It's just extra money on top of it, as long as you can pretend that you needed your phone because you had to ring here or ring there. But this is not 1995. This is not when every single call was billed up together and if you use your phone too much, the bill becomes ridiculous. This is ones where you know, because you have them. Everyone has them. Which would be, for about 100 bucks a month, you'd be able to get as much data as you possibly want, regardless of which one you want to go to. But it rolls on. There's also $1,000 a week to anyone who lives more than 50 kilometres from the work site. So, of course, if you live in Brisbane, but the work is up in Townsville, you're going to get an extra $1,000 a week. In addition, there's 5% annual pay rises every single year to 2027. That's guaranteed higher pay rises than anyone else gets in the economy. Four weeks annual leave, more than five weeks of rostered days off, 10 public holidays in Brisbane and a picnic day when a site shuts down. Tradies that aren't part of the CFMEU, well, they see this for what it is, a dirty deal between the Queensland Government and its union mates. Not sustainable, it can't. In the end, someone's got to pay the extra money for it, so where's that come from? We end up with a heap of businesses closing down. It just sounds like a way to get rid of the small guys and just leave it with the large companies. 
Nurses too spoke to A Current Affair about how unfair guaranteed pay rises between now and 2027, plus all of those extra bits of cushion for people who, yes, are important to the economy, but they are not saving lives. They're giving out these ridiculous perks to construction workers while we've got uh, perinatal mortality rates that have been reported as doubling in the last four years. They're closing down rural maternity facility. We've got 75,000 nurses that have left the profession since the beginning of COVID. That's one in five and partly because they're not paid enough. Now, that's not to mention the situation of hospital ramping in Queensland, worst it has ever been. Now, this is not just one of those things that you say that's part of the laundry list of reasons to get rid of a government. It's a fundamental example of a failure of a health system they have been in charge of for the best part of a decade, and with the exception of three years, the best part of 30 years in Queensland. Now, ambulance ramping is when the patient stays in the back of the ambulance because there's no room in the hospital. That, of course, means that when people go to ring triple O, there is a greater delay before the ambulances turn up. And as we've shown multiple times, there are people who've died in the back of those ambulances waiting to go into the underfunded hospitals, or people who have died waiting for the ambulances, or the people who have died giving up waiting for those ambulances. All of that should be the focus of the government. But, of course, this is all just about politics. And the man who is only a creation of the unions, who only has his position for the few months that he hopefully will have it, because of the unions, of course, defends the deal. Well, this is all about making sure that people who work on our projects earn a decent wage, are safe when they go to work, uh, have reasonable conditions, and to ensure that, the, that those sites are training apprentices, that they are training First Nations people, and they are training women. Seriously? None of these people are earning minimum wage on the work site. Not to mention they get extra money if it gets too hot and they get extra money if it's raining. In fact, double pay if it's raining. All things that don't exist inside the private sector, all things that don't exist outside of the construction sector. But just like big union construction jobs were, were able to continue while everyone else was locked down because of their relationship to Labor governments. These people get treated differently. Why? Because the political power of the CFMEU, from the people who literally man the election boots, the people who are given equal amount of money to spend in an electorate than a political party because they're allegedly independent, from the political party of which they are not just affiliated to, but unions right around the country have 50% of the say in everything, from the candidates that are picked to the policies that are set to the ministries that end up taking place. They are both participant and donor. They are both muscle man and minister, which is why they get this special treatment from a government that has well and truly lost its way. When nurses are willing to complain against a Labor government, you know things are bad, because, of course, their unions are also affiliated to the Labor Party. But they've had enough, and they're willing to go on television, and they're willing to cop the pasting for it. And I say, well done. Now, of course, what happens when you end up adding all of these extra costs? The reality is that the private sector now has to keep up with what is happening in the public sector, which means the overall cost of special union deals, where the government is the one paying the wage, now moves through to increased costs of anyone else who's trying to get anything built or done in Queensland by someone other than the union movement. Now, the Queensland Major Constructors Association has said that all of this is going to hype up costs and cripple productivity. Quote, it basically means we're delivering far less for far more. Directly because of this, we're seeing construction costs go up by 10 to 20 per cent. Supply and demand should be dictating wage rates. Governments should not be interfering in that. And then this government, which again, very good at politics... They've been able to win elections that nobody should have been able to win because of the way that the machine works, the absolute, the soft, the grey power, the influence that they have had over the media. Thankfully, as the days grow, the media in Queensland gets braver and is willing to point out the problems of a rotten and rancid government. Well, of course, this government is all about spin, and they are trying to spin you between now and the next Queensland election that somehow they are doing the things that obviously they have failed on. Homelessness couldn't be a bigger problem right now in the southeast. Remember, we told you about the bloke who moved from country Queensland to Brisbane in the hope that he'd be able to get a job to find a house. He's been unable to do either, so he ends up living in a tent by a motorway. 
These are, by the way, tents that exist in and around the Premier's own electorate. And people trying to fool the voters, not too far from Ipswich, are these two locals who've got a billboard up. And the billboard is, of course, all paid for by the Labor Party. And the advertising says that our Miles government is delivering more homes faster, quote, because every Queenslander deserves a place to call home. Well, you want to know what is happening 100 metres away from the billboard that is lying to Queenslanders that there is no homelessness problem because we're building lots of houses, the traditional lefty Jedi mind trick? Well, have a look at this footage. It was posted up today on the Courier Mail. But when you have a look at the billboard telling you that there are more places than ever before and every Queenslander deserves a home, and nobody's going to argue with that, but look what happens when you just walk slightly down the street. The best part of 100 metres. Homelessness. Homelessness that again continues a little further down the street. More homelessness. They want to tell you via the billboard that they're doing something. The reality is that if you just look on the other side of the window, within a couple of rolls of the tyres, you can see that they are not doing what they are promising that they are doing. It's all spin, it's all BS. And the best that the Prime Minister had when offering air support wasn't to say this was a good government, making good decisions, and here's some examples of the good decisions. It was to bring up Campbell Newman. Now, as you know, when it comes to uh, Australian politics, there was one great sin that Peter Dutton was involved in, and for it he must pay, as must Jacinta Price, as must the 60% of Australians who denied the Prime Minister his place in history, and that, of course, was when we collectively as a country decided to vote no. Now, remember, this started out as 60-40 yes. Now, straight after that, all roads, all criticisms, the only thing that the government could say was not to defend itself on immigration policy that's wildly out of control, on cost of living pressures that they continue to make worse on issues like the biggest number of homeless people of all time in Australia. No, no, no. This next election is all about stopping the Aussie version of Donald Trump. Peter Dutton. Peter Dutton. Peter Dutton. Peter Dutton. Peter Dutton. Peter Dutton. Focus, focus, focus. Endlessly ramp up. Let's pretend that Peter Dutton, the Liberal Party, anyone to the centre-right in Australian politics is just as bad as the worst of the MAGA crowd and in their heart are people who would storm the capital if they could. Now, this is an ugly political tactic and it's one thing to argue against an opposition, but they are, of course, so ridiculously focused and personally focused on the bloke who has been right on how many issues. I repeat, he was where 60% of the Australian population was, not the Prime Minister who started out with 60% of the Australian population. Yet, as you know, the entire focus of the government, their supporters in the media, is get Dutton, name Dutton, scandalise Dutton, throw as much mud as possible to make it seem like there's something weird about the guy. Remember when he was talking about the uh, ticks and crosses in the lead-up to the referendum? Well, of course, they all started. Threat to democracy, undermining our electoral system. The Prime Minister, immediately after being embarrassed, after wasting $450 million, as James Campbell outed in the Sunday papers that Anthony Albanese's already fired up a dirt unit, all of it, to target Peter Dutton. Now, let's be honest, there's been a dirt unit that's been run by many a person against Peter Dutton for a long time, most notably and obviously people that at one point in time were the Prime Minister of this country. They have failed to come up with the smoking gun or even the smoke about why Peter Dutton is a threat to the democracy. Now, the media people, of course, who are often fed by the dirt unit because they often resemble much of the things that a dirt unit would come up with about the endless perils and evils of Peter Dutton, are some of the people who have had face-to-face -face meetings with the Prime Minister. Now, it is thanks to the work of Rex Patrick, the former senator from South Australia, that he was even able to lobby and to push and to eventually break the arm of the government to tell us what was going on for the first six months of the government. In the reporting on the website he was working for, print journalists afforded the opportunity of a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Prime Minister, included Guardian Australia's political editor, Catherine Murphy, who, of course, now works for the Prime Minister. The Australian... Sorry, uh, the Sydney Morning Herald columnist, Nasty Nikki Sava. Well, she does her work for the Prime Minister outside of his office. The hit job man, that is, Peter Harcher, 
The National Affairs Correspondent, James Masola, in fairness, a good bloke. Network 10 Political Editor, Peter Van Onselen, hardly pro-liberal. Uh, the Seven News Political Editor, Mark Riley. And the Foreign Affairs Editor of the Australian Greg Sheridan. I don't think he's in reception too much of uh, the dirt unit, but certainly he got face-to-face -face time. But let's focus in on three of the people who are those most sympathetic to the Prime Minister. We certainly know Catherine Murphy is because, as I said, she went straight from the Turnbull Times into the office of the Prime Ministers. No doubt telling them how journalists get their stories and no doubt part of the reason why there's the explosion, I would suggest, in NDAs and making sure nobody could dare leak what's going on or what the plans are, just a guess. Then, of course, there's nasty Nikki Sava, and she, of course, never misses an opportunity to turn around and say Peter Dutton is the end of the Liberal Party. This program is the... This program, this channel, is the end of democracy. All that garbage. Dutton and Lee have created a foolproof of what not to do election guide. All, of course, because she said that they had to win the Dunkley by-election. She set that standard, by the way, nobody else. The antics of Liberal men will cost the party at the next election. When it comes to Peter Harcher, well, he gets to swan around, doesn't he, after saying things like, Morrison might not have held a hose, but Dutton doesn't hold a policy. Where do these people make their most frequent television appearances to run the lines, the narrative, that come out of places like the Dirt Unit? Well, of course, over on Channel 2. So often on a Sunday morning, they're constantly opining there or over on ABC Radio over and over again. And they've been handed a new playbook of all of the evils that is Peter Dutton, trying to turn him into the Australian version of Donald Trump. Now, I'll be honest, I was not aware that the quarterly essay was focused on Peter Dutton, but it was, and it has been released a couple of weeks ago. There was a review of it in the Australian newspaper today, which is why I want to point you to this. Now, previously, people like Laura Tingle, you know, so middle of the road. She's previously told us that uh, New Zealand was a place via Jacinta Ardern that Australia had so much to learn from. Of course, she ended up uh, bailing before the Labor Party got bashed at an election, so I assume we don't need any more lessons out of New Zealand. But this is all about the bad cop. Let me read you some of the blurb here. Leave it up on screen, because uh, I want to read it here. Or if we actually, let's uh, show the quotes. Dutton became Liberal leader with a strategy to win outer suburban and regional seats from Labor. Since then, we've seen his demolition of the voice and a rolling campaign of culture wars. Because apparently, if you disagree with anything the government's currently doing, ah, problem. You are part of a culture war. What does Peter Dutton know about the Australian electorate? Has he updated Menzies' forgotten people pitch for the age of anxiety? Or will he collapse the Liberals' broad church? Direct quote from one of the people, uh, well, from the bloke who wrote the whole thing. Doesn't this sound like the beginnings of the Aussie Trump narrative? Dutton doesn't need to become Prime Minister to redraw the battle lines of Australian politics. His fight with Albanese over parochial voters was always going to drag the political conversation rightwards. Because remember, when the Labor Party wins, it's a, revelation, it's a revolution forever. When the Liberal Party wins, it's because of cheating. You know, the people who truly believe in democracy, right? On race, on immigration, gender, the pace of transition away from fossil fuels, Dutton's raison d'etre, make Australia afraid again. Oh, we're even using the Trump. Make America great again, but we've come up with our own version. Make Australia afraid again. Then he will offer himself as the lesser of two evils, a serious strong man in the age of anxiety. Bum, bum, bum. And, of course, where does this new playbook for Dutton is Aussie Trump, where do they go to promote it? Oh, that's right, straight on to the ABC. So between what you hear on the radio, Dutton, 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 Dutton Dutton's a problem, Dutton's a problem, Dutton's a problem... Dutton was the one who somehow is going to deny you $275 on power. Dutton's the one who promised to do something about cost of living but has failed to do so. Dutton is the one who put up your petrol prices by increasing it from 23 to 49 cents a litre. Dutton is the one who's brought in near record immigration, meaning, of course, that the housing crisis that continues off the back of it... Oh, that's all Peter Dutton's fault, you see all day, every day, but I just wanted you to know where are they getting their talking points? Because no doubt if they don't get them from the dirt unit and they don't get their messages from the Sunday morning program and they don't get that from the columnists who get their legitimacy in part because they appear on the Sunday morning political program, you can get it from the quarterly essay, which only Greens voters will probably read. Meantime, another issue that obviously is Peter Dutton's fault.
is, again, an extension from the number of people coming into the country right now. Now, again, I say this because I know how intentionally and deliberately this will be misrepresented, so I have to say it every night. I legitimately don't care where you come from, what you look like, what you believe in. What I do believe is that we should have infrastructure that matches the population we have. Currently, we have hospital ramping in record numbers in every state in the country, which means there's not enough hospital beds. Yet, we keep bringing in more people. We know how difficult it is you get to get your kid into your local school because there are too many people that are coming in for the infrastructure that's not been built. If you're a public transport person, that's not being built. If you're a driving person, that's not being built. But, of course, to discuss this issue at all is some sort of dog whistle and racism. Why? Because Nikki Savas says... One of the obvious consequences of so many extra people coming into the country, the best part of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who came in last year, was that on top of everyone else who was looking for a house, they too were looking for a house. And most people do not buy a house as soon as you turn up in a country. Instead, of course, you turn around and need to rent a place. Rental lines in places like Ipswich are so long that 150 people end up looking for every one rental property. That's the list, the line that we show you going round the block for a very small unit in one of the capital cities. We've shown you the place in Bondi where they want to charge you 1200 bucks a week rent and there's construction happening on the very unit block where they want to charge you 1200 bucks. Well, today we learn what the average rent is in Australia and it is an extraordinarily high number. The national rent has now hit $630. The pain keeps piling on for, Australian, for Australia's long-serving renters, asking rents rose their fastest since 17 years in the first quarter. And this wasn't under the Liberal Party. This is not under Peter Dutton. This is right now under your local state government, wall-to-wall -wall Labor, with the exception of Tasmania. And remember, they're only being propped up by Lambie 12 months at a time. The median cost of renting a house in the combined capitals, that being, of course, the capitals of Australia, reached a record $630 a week. They're going back to the nine-owned platform of domain for the information. But that is extraordinary. $630 now is basically what you can expect to rent something in Australia. Nothing fancy, nothing flash. Now, of course, the closer you get to the places where you need to work or the busier cities, the number goes way higher. But that's the reality of Australia when we have taken in too many people in 2022-23. And remember, despite all of the promises that it was going to get cut by this year, in January of this year, it was the highest number of people that have come in in nine years. That was 125,000 people. Going back to Laura Tingle and the lessons we can learn from New Zealand, remember I told you earlier in the week, when it was 175,000 people who came into New Zealand last year, they changed the entire system to now having one that if you come in on a work visa, you have to prove that you can actually do the job via work experience and you'll only be able to stay for three years and it gets renewed every three years. The family reunion system, nowhere near as generous as what happens in Australia, where the best part of 30% of everyone who came into the country last year came in not because they had the skills, but because they were the family member of the person who had the skills. Now, of course, when rent is where it is sitting right now, $630 a week, a lot higher than that. Of course, the closer, as I say, you get to, uh, to the flasher parts of town. We're supposed to believe that the cost of living that will not be improved upon at the upcoming budget, the too little, too late tax cuts, are apparently going to save everyone. Well, remember, as we've told you, if you're trying to pay off a house, you're having to find anywhere between fifteen dollars and $30,000 on top of what you had to before this government came to power. And when you're trying to pay $630 a week in rent, remember, $45,000 is $15 a week extra. $22 a week extra, $32 a week extra, $41 a week extra. It's too little, too late, but are you surprised when it comes to the great gloss job that is this current government? 
Now, take your pick about what you believe to be the greater threat to national security at the moment. Do you believe that it is the radical hate preachers, which, of course, have got a lot louder and a lot more intense in the past few months for the most obvious of reasons? Or are you where much of the left is that apparently it is the far right and the neo-Nazis that is the biggest threat to Australia? Well, it's interesting to note here because... There's been a slight change in rhetoric from a person who just a couple of months ago told us what the biggest threat was right now in 2024. Mike Burgess, of course, the boss of ASIO. Now, he had previously said that Islamic terror was becoming the top threat in Australia. Radical Islamic terror was becoming the biggest issue. In fact, we have the tape of him saying it. We've seen heightened community tensions that have translated to some incidents of violence connected to protest activity. We've also observed increased rhetoric encouraging violence in response to the conflict. Hateful rhetoric has targeted Israel and the Jewish community, as well as the Muslim and Palestinian communities. Sunni violent extremism poses the greatest religiously motivated extremist threat in Australia. Come again, I'm not the ASIO boss. That's what he says, looking at all of the information that he has. But as you know... He's no longer a favoured son of the Labor Party and certainly the Prime Minister. And remember, their narrative is is that apparently neo-Nazis, this is the single worst problem in the country right now. Now, again, as I've said, I said it on Australia Day. Anyone who's trying to hope for a race war in any direction has no support in any way, shape or form from normal people in Australia. Dozens of people turning up in the middle of Australia Day. Again, no support from normal people. It's pathetic to watch them pretend that they're going to somehow start a race war. Now, of course, in my view, they are completely wrong, completely bonkers and completely off the deep end. But as are the hate preachers. So if ASIO says it's the hate preachers, not the far right that seems to be the big problem, I'm probably going to pay attention. But because this bloke has been booted out of the National Security Committee, he is now trying to throw some red meat in the direction of the people who would prefer the problem to be. The people turning up all dressed in black on one train station and one park on Australia Day in Sydney. Because Mike Burgess again and ASIO have addressed a Senate committee. This Senate committee is trying to look into what the big problems are in Australia. And guess what? Apparently it's the right-wingers, the extreme right-wingers, the nasty people that, of course, we were just talking about there. So literally, a couple of months ago, it was radical Islam. Now, of course, it's the extreme right There's been a rise in activity from racist and national extremists who want to spark a race war in Australia. Over the last year and a half, the nation's top security agency has warned in the submission to a parliamentary inquiry into far-right extremism. ASIO said ideologically motivated violent extremists accounted for about a quarter of its entire counter-terrorism work. They say that particularly nationalist and racist violent extremism remains a threat, but of course... Remember his own assessment about what the primary threat was, and I'm I'm no way pretending there's not a problem with some far-right people in this country. Not pretending there's not at all. But you go from one being the threat that is of greatest importance to now trying to pretend that that we have an equivalent problem happening on the white nationalist side from an inquiry, which, of course, is stacked into trying to find that definition. Remember, there have been universities in this country that have turned around and have tried to link things like a reverence or recognition for things like Australia Day or Anzac Day as kind of the gateway drug towards nationalism and extremism. Now, again, to the extremes, they have no no protection in any decent person in the country. And I want the security officials to go hard after all of them in all of their forms... But we seem to have a narrative trying to build here in the same way that, of course, we have the investigation and an envoy into anti-Semitism and apparently there's going to be someone into Islamophobia doing the same job for the, go- uh, for the government. Because, of course, when it comes to Albo, he can't possibly pick a lane. He couldn't possibly say that one thing is worse than the other. He has to pretend that everything is the same. No matter what you can see with your own eyes, what you hear in the news each and every day. Hence why I call him each way Albo. And it seems like the security officials are trying to change the narrative in order to keep their jobs. We'll all learn about that one together. 
I'm sorry to say the same thing a few times in a row uh, in a week, but sometimes the news falls in a snowball way that means we talk about something more than once in a week and it gets, the tr it gets truer each day that it rolls on. Now, you know that I've uh, told you that one of the biggest, if not the biggest threat to Donald Trump becoming the next president of the United States in terms of elections is the issue in and around right to choose or abortion legislation. Now, according to, according to current polling, you can see here that if the polls were true, Donald Trump wins. You need 270 electoral college votes to become the president. He would have 312. That's what the map would look like. But, of course, when it comes to what the swing states actually think on abortion, if it became the number one issue, it would be the Democrats who would win by 317 votes to the Republicans, 212. One of the states that absolutely Trump needs to win is a state called Arizona. Arizona is the place where John McCain came from. It is the place, too, where the biggest anti-Trumpers come from and they were able to see Arizona shift for the first time in a long time blue. The polls suggest that it is about to go back to red, but as we've told you this week, abortion is most likely going to send it deep blue. As you know, the Supreme Court in Arizona, it made a decision to essentially wipe an existing law and go back to what the law was before Arizona was even a state. Now, when there was an attempt to deal with this and fix things back up to reality... Local Republicans who have control of the parliament in Arizona didn't even let it get debated. So you have a scenario where anyone who is sane knows that the position is not one that people in Arizona are going to accept, yet the people who are in charge of the parliament will not move out of this insanity. Hence why Sean Hannity is getting particularly focused on Fox News about the problem and knowing that it will wipe Trump out. And the people on the left are so de desperate, attacking Trump now for an Arizona Supreme Court ruling that upholds what is a Civil War era law banning abortion. This will be fixed in the next week or two. Let not your heart be troubled. I can, I can pretty much assure that that will happen. Trump opposes the law and this ruling, or you can believe Joe's make pretend Donald Trump that doesn't exist. But if the local politicians won't move Trump's way, it becomes an issue going into the election. In Florida and Arizona, both places that he needs to win, there will be on the ballot constitutional measures to set the limit on abortions way higher than the local Republicans have been arguing for. We have seen in deep red states that they tend to vote deep blue when it comes to the issue of abortion. If that happens again in November, Trump is done. Quick break, back with more plenty to talk about, including our mate Warren Mundine has had plenty to say about the treaty process playing out in Victoria and discussions of it beginning now in New South Wales. We'll get to all of that in a moment's time here on Paul Murray Live. How exciting is this? Well, you know that I'm not a believer, but I do believe in the concept of God's country. It's a place called Queensland, and if I could get there, if I could move the man cave, I would, and if I could kiss the ground, I'd do it each and every day. But alas, the man cave remains in parts unknown. However, two of our guests tonight are in beautiful Brisbane, the wonderful Lisa God. I've been too long, my friend. Of course, uh, the boss of Adonia Media, lovely to see you. And Henry Pike joining us as well, an MP, LNP uh, MP in the Federal Parliament, and of course representing his bit of Queensland. Lovely to see you both. How are we? Good, good. good yeah, we're happy to be beaming into your man cave, even though we are in beautiful Queensland. Correct, but kiss the ground for me, particularly Broad Beach, if you can get down the M1. Now, let's have a chat, uh, Lisa. <laughs> you were in the room today uh, when the Prime Minister was making the series of announcements in and around industrial policy, but also pretty piss weak uh, way of trying to back in Miles, pretending, oh, he understands the... He was hardly full-throated in the support of the man who, let's be honest, is hardly enthralling your fellow Queenslander. Yeah, he, and he had to bring up the ghost of Campbell Newman, oh, so that was about please. the best that he had when he was asked. You know, but it was no surprise, but that's what he relied on. So that, and uh, you know that, you know, you, you can't put your, you can't bet on that they'll do well here. And he didn't want to sort of go into what happened with the by-elections. So 
You know, there was no surprise with the answer. Yeah, surprise. Now, Henry, what about the CFMEU stuff? I mean, the, the, the special deals for anyone working on a government project, obviously there's a lot of uh, construction that's, uh, that all of our state governments are backing in at the moment, despite the fact the IMF says some of this stuff is actually inflationary, but shh, don't talk about it, bad for politics. But how do we get to a scenario where workers are ending up getting $100 a week phone bonus if they happen to work in the construction industry when all of us would know you could get as much uh, gigs and data and phone calls as you want for a hundred bucks a month, let alone a week. Absolutely. Paul, it's a real sweetheart deal, but I think the most uh, critical part of the deal for them is uh, the extra loading they get on hot days and on rainy days. And I don't know if, you've, uh, if your viewers have spent much time in Queensland, but that pretty much takes up every single day of the year uh, throughout uh, every single season. Uh, but Really, what we've got to appreciate is that Stephen Miles isn't there because he was the best man to save the furniture uh, in the parliament as they head towards the October election. He was there because he was appointed as Premier because he was the best man to secure these sort of deals on the way out that will look after his union masters for all the years to come as we head into a big build around the Olympics and around other major infrastructure we're going to have to deal with over the next decade. Yeah. So that's what. That's how we've ended up here. It's an outrage, but, uh, you know, he's, he's just taking the piss at this point. Yeah, 100%. And the thing is, you know, we're, we're nowhere near caretaker at the moment, so a lot of these deals are going to be put in place that either they, for whatever bizarre reason, won the election and they get to, you know, dance around, or it's the landmines that are put in for the next one. And as Henry just mentions, Lisa, of course... There's a lot of building to be done for the Olympic Games. Now, where the stadium will be and what the stadium and how much and all the rest, there's going to be plenty of money there in and around those projects. But how do you think average Queenslanders have reacted to this? I mean, look, I get it, I, you know, a tough job to be out in the rain and all the rest of it, but the idea that it's automatically doubled because of the weather, um, anyone working in, a, you know, a cutting lawns or anything else in Queensland doesn't get double each day. Gee, Paul, could you imagine what the increase in pay would be for journalists who are out covering cyclones <laughs> or, you know, those are... It's raining today. We better do a story because That's it's a raining point. today. Everyone story. would be so volunteering. The media don't cotton onto this one. Oh, my goodness, yeah, yeah. No, but, look, you just have to drive around the city, for example, and, and the couple of big developments that we have happening here now, it's just a, yeah, a street full of CFMEU flags. So the unions are there, and I think if you're the average punter, like you say, out mowing lawns or, you know, trying to out there earn an honest dollar, you look at that and just go, really? That, uh, especially if you're running a small business. Can I fly the flag for small business? Oh, you know, mate, go hard. You've got employees who are looking at that and saying... You know, well, how the hell, why aren't we getting more of this? You have the business owner going, well, I can't afford to give you any of that because I'm being reamed with taxes and superannuation and everything else that comes with the benefit of running a business. And yet you've got the unions here just, you know, raking it in for their for their um, employees on these construction sites, etc. Yeah, my brother's working outside all day, every day, six days a week on the sunny coast. I think he would love the idea of the guaranteed wage, let alone the double pay that's going to be going yeah. in there. So shout out to you, Jason. Love you, mate, as always. Nikki and all of the girls. Love, love, love you. All right. So let's talk here also about what Peter Dutton's had to say in the past couple of days. Yes, it's in relation to uh, the bigger issues of the world, Israel, Palestine, all the rest of it. But he focused in particularly in his conversation with Shari and also in a conversation with Ray Hadley today that at its heart this government is still playing university politics. Now, let's step back to that clear principle as opposed to necessarily what type of student politics they're playing out. Henry, you see them in the parliament all day, every day, right? And uh, they may well have worked for Wayne Swan and eventually become the treasurer, or they are, of course, the, the brother of the union boss who ends up sort of uh, with a relationship in and around uh, uh, industrial relations, or we end up with Chris Bowen who's sort of uh, uh, doing everything he can to make sure that uh, he can pretend that we can change the weather by changing 1% of what's happening in global emissions, it does feel like this government is still stuck, as if they're trying to uh, fight Twitter battles or fight it back at university. Well, I think it's more insidious than that, Paul, because I don't necessarily... I, I completely agree that a lot of what they do is very undergraduate and juvenile, but I think that this is really not about foreign policy at all. It's, it's about domestic politics. It's about trying to play to a cohort uh, within some of their inner city seats who will uh, have a negative view uh, towards uh, the, the, the Israeli uh, response to what's happened on October the 7th. And I think that the fact that they're dragging our foreign policy uh, in uh, to completely radically change our position on such matters just to appease a rather small cohort within some key seats of theirs I think is is pretty disgraceful, and I think Peter Dutton's completely right to have called it out. And I'm hoping that sanity prevails before they go too.
too far down that path. Yeah, so Lisa, I mean, uh, Peter Dutton trying to put himself basically sort of in, in the position of, of trying to commentate as well as co uh, combat what the government is trying to do. Do you think that this is the right lane for him to be trying to say what this government is really all about and about how they are making some of their decisions? Because as I explained at the start of the show, we all know what Labor's going to try to do, which is to pretend, you know, Aussie Trump, Aussie Trump, Aussie Trump, threat to democracy. Yeah, look, I think what was good about Peter Dutton today is he came out and he said zero tolerance. And I think more Australians want to hear that sort of uh, firm leadership when we, we look at who our you know, leaders are in, in Canberra. So you mentioned I was at the Queensland Press, Press Club lunch today and the Prime Minister was speaking. When he took a question on this today, he basically accused Peter Dutton of playing politics with this. So I find that very interesting when you put that against the background of what we were discussing about the pressure on Labor now to try to win over and fight that sort of green uh, challenge that they've got coming in relation to people who are supporting Palestine. So I just, yeah, it was rich on his behalf, I think, to accuse Dutton of playing politics. And I think that Peter Dutton's doing the right thing and coming out and showing some leadership on this. Can I throw you a, a bit of a wild one that you may want to be prepared for, but I'll go to the professional politician to make him dance first, um, which is, uh, Henry, South East Queensland, um, a very big chunk of it has gone very left very quickly. All right. Um, now, thankfully, Adrian Schrinner was able to hold on to the mayoralty, which was a sign, and I, that to me was the ultimate test of, OK, how far is it changing? Plenty of state seats are expected to flip over to the Greens. The federal seat of Brisbane went from Liberal straight to Green. We didn't go via the Labor Party. Um, several other examples, expectation to come into South East Queensland. Of your understanding of that change, is it something that really is connected into the, for want of a better term, the cool sort of valley kids and the sort of cashed up people in Paddington? Or is it something that the Liberal Party actually has to understand extends a lot deeper and a lot further? And those preferences, of course, can deny you being able to win seats back like Ryan. It's a, it's a very important question, Paul, and certainly something the party's been grappling with here uh, over the last couple of years since we lost those critical seats uh, within the centre of Brisbane. Uh, I think, though, that it has been overplayed. I think there's a lot of people who uh, perhaps didn't have a positive view towards the previous uh, Liberal government federally and parked their uh, vote as a bit of a protest within the Greens. They couldn't quite bring themselves to vote Labor. Uh, and I think that the council election really re reflects that there was a bit of a shifting vote between Labor and Greens, but really the LNP vote held quite strong within the centre of Brisbane. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity for us to pick up seats within some of these inner ring cities in the upcoming state election and press on uh, to a, a federal election, you know, at some point between now and, uh, and May next year, uh, where we have a really good shot of picking up those seats again. Um, not necessarily, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be an easy task, but it mm. certainly is something that I think is, is doable for the party here and, in Queensland. And again, Lisa, my version of the same uh, uh, question is, I mean, you have obviously worked in media and in and around uh, the corporate types of Brisbane for a long time, right? You understand the city mm. for the most obvious of reasons. There has been this change. Um, at times, do you feel that... Um, the woke is being overplayed by people who live in a certain area or there is a change in Brisbane that everyone has to get used to and aware of, either because that's what's organically happened or a lot of people moved up there in the past couple of years. Well, yeah, I think we do have to try and look at what's happened in the demographics. So if you take this, the federal seat of Ryan, for example, you've got a lot of younger families, and I'm talking, you know, 30s plus, have moved in there with their the young kids. So they are, from what I understand, amongst that cohort that's, that's voting Green. And I questioned a number of people I know who, are, who fit that cohort, who also voted Green uh, at different levels of government, and I've said, why? Because they're, they're, the way they live and, and their sort of yeah. belief system and values align more with the Liberal Party than they do with the Greens. And with the last council election, for example, they said, oh, look, we, we knew Schrinner would, would win, he's done a great job, but we just wanted to give the Greens a vote because, you know, someone else deserved a chance. <laughs> And wow. I was like, that makes no sense yeah. whatsoever. If, if in one argument you're saying, you know, Shrina's done a great job, we've got all these extra parks, the roads, etc., yeah. the, the growth in the city, uh, the infrastructure, why then would you then... Oh, because you know, it just seemed like the right thing to do. And I'm surprised at how many people still think Greens represent environment, good for well, the environment. Correct, I, I just, but, I just but think also... The Liberal Party has a big job to do 
in explaining that to people. Yeah, but also, as I've said, as I've said uh, too, that one of the great battle lines is that I think in previous generations, the Greens were able to wrap themselves uh, in the environment to cover up all that other crazy stuff. In the lead-up to the next election, they're oh. going to try to do it with renting, and renting, obviously, a great, uh, much bigger factor closer to the cities. Because, again, if their primary vote's sitting at 12, but 30% of people rent, well, that's a little bit of uh, movement for them to move on. But hopefully, again, the idea of, oh, look, he's going to win anyway. Everyone, remember, OK, even if you think that you, you think what's going to happen... Plenty of things have come down to just a handful of votes, a handful of preferences. So every single vote matters, regardless of you want to waste it on the Greens or you want to spend it in a, somebody who will actually form a government. Quick break, back with more. Winners and losers of the week, if you want to tell me what you think, jump onto our socials. In the meantime, you'll find out from these two. Next. Here with Henry Pike and with Lisa Goddard. Uh, got enough time to go through the winners and losers of the week for you guys. Lisa, who stands out for you as somebody who made it or dudded it this week? Gee, you know, after today's announcement with uh, uh, the Prime Minister, I think the uh, renewable energy companies, both here and potentially overseas, are the big winners. And I imagine there'll be a, a, you know, a fast track to Canberra now to try to get their piece of this uh, subsidised future that we're in for. Well, I definitely hope that the ones that are owned by billionaires and former prime ministers, that they're first in line because they have no other source of funding. I'm sure they are. No other source of funding mm -hmm. than the taxpayer. Yep. Henry? Yep. Well, I think the big loser, of course, will be the Australian taxpayer on, this, on the opposite side of that same coin. He's going to have to fund uh, all the uh, grand uh, you know, uh, b uh, thought bubbles that the prime minister is coming up with through that policy. Uh, but in terms of a big winner, I couldn't miss the opportunity to go hyper-local and give a shout-out to the Redland Modern Country Music Club, who turned 50 on the weekend. They had a big uh, shindig at the clubhouse. And forget about Broad Beach, Paul, when you're next in Queensland, you've got to join me. We're going to go listen to some country music in the Redlands. Ken Oath, I'll be there. Don't worry. No question at all. Just quickly before you go, uh, there's a big concert that's happening right now. Uh, a big concert, big uh, convention happening in America. It's called CinemaCon. This is when all of the movie uh, companies get together and show the people who own cinema chains some of the stuff that might be coming out in the next 12 months. There was an announcement today that the lady who, of course, is an Australian... Uh, a star in Margot Robbie. Well, of course, she didn't just star, but she produced the Barbie movie, and now she's going to be producing a Monopoly movie. Lisa, do you imagine that just like everyone at midnight decided to turn up and wear their pink, that somehow you will have your choice of thimble, monocle, or whatever, <laughs> what top hat, and that's what we'll be turning up to watch in two years' time? Well, I think it will be a case of uh, don't pass go without collecting at least, what, $1.4 billion they made out of Barbie at the, the box, box office worldwide. Yep. So, But the, the hat, top hat and the monocle was going to be my joke to you. I could see you in a, a top hat monocle turning up to, to do the Monopoly one. Well, in fairness, of course, uh, being uh, somebody here on Sky News Primetime, that's what I wear when I'm not on the air, just to confirm the, the perception that <laughs> yeah. the Guardian has of what we do all day, every day. I certainly do smoke the cigars. <laughs> Bad, terrible, but you get my point. Henry, could you imagine... Now, look, this thing's going to make a billion dollars, So, but still, would you imagine sitting there and how they're going to turn the board game into two hours of movies? Well, I played a two-hour game of Monopoly with my four-year-old son on Saturday and he beat me hands down. Oh, so, I've... what's the difference? The arguments, Him... the arguments. Yeah. Well, I had that's to teach him the rules as I went along, but he yeah. still beat me. That's what I hope, is, is that at some point, halfway through the movie, somebody just flips the table and walks out, because that's sadly the way it works for many families <laughs> each and every day. Henry knows because he thought about it, but he went, oh, but it's my four-year-old kid and I can't do it. Lisa, of course, would never do such a terrible yeah. thing. Lovely to see you both. Well, then Have you a... see the... You go, quick. You'd see the money stashed under the board then. <laughs> yes. Oh, look at you. You're... Oh, so the secret bank under the table. <laughs> Listen to this one. Pay in cash. Well played. <laughs> I like it. Thank you, guys. Do appreciate it. Have a wonderful weekend in Queensland. All right, quick break. Back with more here on Paul Murray Live, about five minutes away from the late debate. We're done for the week. Go Tigers, go Yankees. Now, quickly before we go, though, Sunday night. Now, as always, you're there for the Sunday showdown. Sunday night, you're always there for Paul Murray Live at 9 o'clock Eastern. But this Sunday night, and for every Sunday night to come, Danica and James, Danica DiGiorgio and the wonderful James McPherson, together at 8 o'clock Sunday night. Make sure that you watch it. The ideas they got for the show is stuff that's never happened on the channel before, and they're all going to be awesome. So all the best to James and Danica on their new show. In the meantime, here's the current show that we also love, The Late Debate.